Todd Black, uh, you produced Being the Ricardos, which is about a dramatic week in the lives of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, uh, you know, during the Red Scare, the political climate of the time. Uh, how did this project uh, initially come your way to tell the story about these incredibly well-known uh, public figures? Um, in 1995, uh, I was interested in doing uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz's life story. And at that time, um, we couldn't acquire the rights to it. And um, I think a number of people have tried over the years uh, and uh, their children, Lucy and, and Desi, um, I just don't think we're ready to do that at that time. And so uh, many, many years later, uh, we tried again. I had a young executive uh, working with me named Jenna Block and um, she had done some, some film work uh, studies when she was in college about Lucille Ball's um, film career. So we both talked about that and I said, let me, let me try again. And, and ultimately, uh, Lucy Arnaz, uh, Lucille Ball's daughter and Desi's daughter came to my office at Sony and we sat down and we met and she knew that I had done a number of other people's true life stories and, and into films and we, we have started a trust building thing because I think anytime you do true life stories, you have to have trust with the family that is still around. And, um, and we started meeting and meeting and meeting. And she said, you know, I don't want to soften it. I want to really make it real and raw and honest. And uh, ultimately we talked about who the best person was. And in my mind, there was only really one person that I wanted to talk to. There was nobody else, which was Aaron Sorkin. And um, everybody told me he was impossible to get to and impossible to commit and will, it will never happen. And that I always have taken as I'll get him and it will happen. That's the way I've run my career as a producer. So um, with the help of his then agent, um, I, uh, I started calling him relentlessly and meeting with him and he was very intrigued, but he wasn't quite ready to commit. And we kept meeting and he was trying to figure out the best way to do it, which is why he wasn't fully committing yet, which I really respected, but he wasn't giving me a no. So as long as I wasn't getting a no, I, I, stayed, uh, I stayed with him on that. And um, one thing led to another and um, ultimately, he, he came to see me one day and he said, I, I think I have it figured out. And we sat with him and he, um, he said, I want to do one week and I want to make the communist scare part of it. And I want to do each day something else happening. And I don't want to do a traditional biopic, which we didn't want anyway. And then we had Lucy come in, Lucy Arnaz come in and meet him and it all kind of happened that way. You know, once he figured it out, it, it happened pretty quickly. And then, you know, uh, the rest is history. Uh, yeah, and, and when you're telling the story that involves so much real life uh, uh, media, uh, film history, uh, TV history, like are there a lot of like rights and permissions that you need to wade through uh, in addition to uh, having the, the blessing and working with, uh, uh, Lucy and Desi? No, there really weren't. Uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of public figures and uh, most people were not alive anymore. Uh, so we really just had to deal with uh, Lucy and Desi's parents' rights uh, and their books that they had written uh, themselves. But no, there really weren't a lot of rights problems, thank God, because oftentimes there are. I've done movies where I've had to go through tons of rights issues and I, I did not need to here. Uh, and of course, you're portraying two of the most recognizable uh, people in, in television history. Uh, so casting is, is crucially important. You know, originally, uh, Kate Blanchett had been attached, and then it was Nicole Kidman, and we've got uh, Javier Bardem playing Desi. Uh, what was that, what were those considerations like uh, in that process of, of finding the right Lucy and Desi? It was a hard uh, casting uh, road that we went down. Um, and ultimately, uh, I'm thrilled with the result of Nicole Kidman and of Javier, who chased me for a long time, which I loved. Uh, he would come to my office, we would go to lunch, he would send me, his agent would film him performing uh, uh, different Desi 
hellos to me and then send them to me via text. It, Javier really chased it. And the minute Nicole heard about it, she really wanted it as well. And, um, you know, I mean, listen, casting is a tricky thing when you, when you do these movies. Uh, you know, Aaron and I did not want to have imitations. You know, you, you're never going to duplicate Lucille Ball or Desi Arnaz. It's never going to happen. They were, they were one of a kind and that's it. So what we wanted was, you know, people that were incredibly good actors that could bring the essence of Lucille Ball and the essence of Desi Arnaz, but not imitating them. We didn't need that. That wasn't what Aaron ever wanted. He didn't write it that way. He didn't want to direct it that way. He didn't want it that way. And, and once I think, um, you know, we were able to, to meet and talk with Nicole and, and Javier about that, they understood that. And so the, that took off some of the pressure of, no, 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 you don't need to look exactly like Lucille Ball. We do want you to look like Lucy Ricardo, you know, because we're recreating some of those iconic, fantastic moments from I Love Lucy, but you do not need to look like Lucille Ball. You know, that's never gonna happen with any actor we would have cast. So we got off of that. Aaron was very smart like that. He was so intelligent, so smart like that. He's like, I don't want that. That will completely kill us if we try to do that. And so we got rid of any of that. And I think it really served us well. Uh, and what were some of the challenges of of really recreating this world that Lucy and Desi lived in, the, that period of Hollywood, uh, the set of I Love Lucy? Like, what you know, how many locations were used versus sets? Like, what what were those sorts of considerations? Well, the the recreation of the apartment of the Ricardos' apartment was as fun as it gets. I remember the first day I walked on set, and and John Hutman, who's an incredible production designer. Uh, he, he, you know, obviously felt like he won the lottery when, when, when we hired him for this. Um, and he had, a, a, an amazing, uh, woman who worked with him that, that found all the, you know, things all around the apartment that were on the fireplace mantle or on the coffee table. There were a lot of, I love Lucy fans that, you know, if they weren't the exact thing, they were duplicates of it. So if you look at the apartment and you look at the actual I Love Lucy show, it's pretty much, you know, verbatim it. A couple of exceptions here and there. So that was really fantastic to recreate that. Obviously, we recreated the studio at Sunset Gower. We recreated the sponsorship signs. I'm sure you saw those um, and the, you know, the booth and uh, the bleachers and the, the backstage. Um, which we did uh, a lot of that on the Queen Mary, which was very clever and very fun to, to, to work on the Queen Mary. And then various locations are around Los Angeles, um, you know, brought in old cars. It was really fun, actually, to, to get to recreate that and to have Susan Lyle, our costume designer, come in and, you know, uh, find vintage clothes and recreate them or build them, uh, be that as it may. And, um, really try to stay true to that period. There's so much picture, there's so many pictures and you know, so much you can look at now to really make it authentic and, you know, and, but not stand out, just kind of made it, made it feel very natural. And, you know, we have, I think some of the best people in their trades and their crafts working on the movie and Aaron's script demands that and Aaron as the director demanded that in a, in a great way because you need to make it real. You need to make people feel like you're there at that time period. And the, the great news is Sunset Gower Studios, still a lot of that feels, we didn't have to change a lot of that. Um, yeah, and, and you being a, a producer, uh, you know, of course, uh, yourself and this telling the story of, uh, you know, a, a Hollywood, you know, TV production, uh, like where there's particular details that you especially, you know, enjoyed exploring about the history of, of TV and entertainment in this period? Oh my God, it's, you know, as a film producer to, to get to go work uh, on a on a iconic people like Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and 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 show the machinations of their relationship and their marriage and their professional relationship on I Love Lucy. Come on, that's every producer's dream. So you know, I felt I felt like I won the lottery on this one, and uh, and that it came out so well. I'm beyond thrilled, and I got to work with Aaron Sorkin who, you know, was my dream come true to work with since I got in the, in the movie and TV business, and that he loves this period and he loves behind the scenes 
things like this. If you, you know, if you look at so much of, you know, between newsroom and sports, you know, all the things he's done, you know, he, he, he lives, he loves the space. So it was a kind of a double win for me in that regard. And I, I couldn't be, I couldn't be more thrilled. It's, it, it really is to get to tell iconic people's stories as a film producer is kind of a dream come true, actually, particularly with someone like Aaron. Uh, well, I want to congratulate you on your work on the film. Um, you know, as as people will be seeing it uh, in in the coming uh, month, uh, I think, from as we're recording this. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's, it's been a pleasure thank talking you. to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tamar Thomas. You produced Belfast, uh, Kenneth Branagh's autobi uh, semi autobiographical film about his childhood in Northern Ireland. Uh, and you've actually worked with. Uh, him for for many years now uh, previously as an assistant more recently as a producer uh, how did that professional relationship get started um i was uh his uh, assistant stage manager for his very first um theater company way back when and uh sort of stuck with him ever since um i've really enjoyed working with him continuing because he could it's such a varied career and doing lots and lots of different stuff. You know, we've gone theater, film, TV, radio, you know, so it's, it's been an extraordinary time and I'm very thankful. Uh, and, and how has, you know, that, in, in, you know, evolved over time? I imagine over those years, like you developed this, this, this trust with each other uh, creatively. How does that, how does that come about? I think my, my job is to sort of um, to, you know, to make keep him happy, because if he's happy, then the rest of the unit are happy. And, you know, and um, he's um, he's a delight to work with. You know, he's really he's delightful and kind and considerate and. Yeah. And, and of course, this film is is so personal to him specifically. Uh, what was it like working with him at, to try and kind of recreate this this sense of his childhood, this memory of his childhood? Um, the thing was, I needed to make him feel safe and secure, and to enable uh, him to do the best work that he was able to do. So there was a lot of research into the script. And, and the history, we did a lot of work in that. And then we were able then to put the best people around him. He's got a very core sense, a loyal group of um, collaborators and, you know, who were really eager to come and work with him again, and especially on this piece. Uh, and of course, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, creating the these the story of you know people in his life. Uh, what was that casting process like? In Jamie Dornan, Katrina Balfe, uh, Judy Dench, who's worked with him many times. Like, how was assembling that family? Um, we, what we really wanted to do really on this was finding the right people. So it was more that they were the right people, and then it was an added bonus if they were a well-known name. Um, so the crew uh, part was the casting of Buddy. He was our sort of key. Once we got him, it, then it was, you know, quite straightforward to go to the other people. And obviously people who came from um, Northern Ireland, you know, we looked at, at actors who come from there first. And obviously we were incredibly lucky that we had Jamie Nor Dornan and uh, Kieran Hines, who are from there, and Katrina is just across the border. And Judy, who, you know, whose uh, um, mother was Irish. So, you know, they all had, everybody in the cast had some sort of Irish blood within them. And that, that helped, I think, with the casting and the storytelling. Uh, and you shot this in the fall of 2020, which, of course, uh, you know, was right in, you know, amid the, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine as a producer uh, that creates its own challenges, the protocols, the safety, how it changes, how everyone works. Hmm. No, it was um, it was, you know, anxiety uh, inducing, I would say, but um, 
a main priority, as it is with all filming, is to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, the well-being of our cast and crew was the priority. Um, and, you know, we needed to make sure that everybody felt protected. We did, um, you know, which I think most people, you know, we tested, tested and tested. And we had um, zones and therefore and different people had their different colored armbands. So you knew if you could cross into different the zones and we cleaned, you know, and fogged night and day. I'm sure that's everybody's doing all the same things. And we put the cast into one hotel. And what happened was because of all of this, there was a great sort of feeling of family across the whole unit. Um, it did bring everybody together um, really in, in a very nice way. Uh, and you shot in, uh, you know, in Belfast, also in England. Uh, what was it like balancing those locations to create this kind of unified sense of, of this neighborhood and this place? Um, that's the cleverness of Jim Clay and uh, our wonderful uh, Northern Irish location team um, who were fantastic, who were just took on the challenge of, you know, working in COVID creatively and also with, you know, restricted budgets, um, did an incredible job, in which I'm forever grateful. Um, and, you know, it's it's this intimate uh, uh, family story, but they're also, it's punctuated by these intense moments of, of activity, the riots, uh, a car bombing, uh, like how, how, you know, challenging and, and you know, what were, what were the, the challenges of, of those days of shooting and and you know creating those set pieces yeah and in in the time of covid we were very lucky with our um riot guys because of course we could put them with scarves and masks over their faces so that when we had more than five people on a set we were able to mask them up and the, so therefore they could be close together um and, you know, we have a great, you know, special effects team, uh, uh, Dave Watkins and um, Jimmy O'D, our stunt guys, who work with lots together. And then with Ken, you know, they have a shorthand because they've worked with Ken for lots of times. They were able to work quickly and efficiently. Um, and therefore, you know, you're not doing big, long setups and lots of rehearsals. You were able to do it quite quickly um, and to enable people to work safely. Uh, and the film is, is mostly in black and white. Was that always, uh, you know, uh, Kenneth's uh, uh, goal for this uh, to create yeah. that sense of memory? Yeah, it was like on the first page of the, this, on the very first draft of the, you know, the, the thing it said in black and white. So yeah, it was always in his arm, you know, in, in his thoughts. And it was just, you know, it's a, sort of that sense of going back but, you know, and um, and one's memory, you know, we grew, you know, black and white TV was what we watched. And, you know, it sort of takes us back to that time. And I think that Harris, you know, did an incredible job. You know, the the black and the white is so beautiful. It's such an intense color. And then when you get those splashes of color that come in when they go to the cinema, which is when, you know, you go into his fantasy, you know, his fantasy and his other life, it's just I think extraordinary. Um, and you've got uh, uh, Van Morrison, Belfast native, uh, uh, contributing a lot of music to the mm -hmm. film. Uh, what was it like getting him on board? And you know, was you know him being from Belfast was that a very easy uh, kind of decision for him to make to to come and be a part of this? It was an easy decision for us to make that we wanted him from the very beginning. So we started. Off as soon as we had this draft of the script was to try and persuade Van to come join us. So he got a very, very, uh, he was one of the first guys to ever get a draft of the script. And he read it and he he loved it and he spoke to Ken. And, you know, he, you know, he calls himself, you know, a local man and he's, you know, he's respected over there. He calls himself a corner boy. He had understood what Ken was writing and got it and he wrote the, the first song for us, just sent it over and said, would this work? It was beautiful. Um, and then, you know, it was very collaborative on the songs that we wanted and getting the licensing and the rights for that. He's been great. Um, and as you mentioned, there are scenes where, uh, you know, the characters are at 
at the movie theater and and we're getting a sense of, of sort of uh, this this young boy's uh, inspirations from film. Uh, were there like what were the rights uh, you know and kind of a, a process uh, for for those films and those uh, clips? Because um, at first in one of the first drafts of the films, Ken had quite a lot of films in there, and uh, as as the rights issues came up, some of them got dropped because they were very difficult to get or even too expensive. Um, but I have to say the films that we have included there, the uh, rights holders were fantastically supportive and we've been incredibly lucky. Um, and yeah, no, yeah we've, they've been great with us, really great. We're very, very thankful. Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on uh, this film um, as it's, uh, you know, recently released and, and chugging along in the awards conversation. Uh, and, and thank you so much for uh, talking with me about it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for your patience of my uh, lack of eloquence. <laughs> no worries. Bless you. <laughs> Tanya Sagachian, you produced Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog, based on the novel by Thomas Savage about a rancher who torments his new sister-in-law in, -law in uh, 1920s Montana. Uh, what were your initial thoughts about this story and the book when they were first brought to you? Well, the book was first brought to me by Jane, um, and that was in May 2017, and I've lived and breathed it every day since then. Um, so it's something I've thought about in great depth. Um, I, I fell in love with it overnight. I, it's very, very rare when you get given a piece of material for you to feel um, that it, it has a complete self to, to its, its shape and structure and that there's an inevitable but surprising ending. And I think that's the thing you're always looking for as a producer, something that can take you on a journey which um, it feels really honest and true, but also upends you at the end. And I had goosebumps and on my neck when I put the final page down but more importantly than that for me was the fact that Jane had given it to me and um, you know Jane is such a trailblazer in our business she's a, a, a woman who has carved her own voice and her own mastery of cinema over the last um, 30 years I guess and was a huge influence on me as a filmmaker We'd met 10 years previously when I read her script for Bright Star and um, I'd been running the funds at the UK at the time, the National Film Funds, and I was able to invest in it and get to know her. And we immediately formed a kind of creative synergy with one another. And she was really keen for us to be able to, to find something to work on together again in film. But that being 10 years previous and uh, she'd made television since then. So I was really keen to get her back into cinema and get it back into filmmaking. But we both looked at one another and said, neither of us are men, neither of us American. This is a Montana story. Um, and it was really, really important to us that we were able to kind of uh, embed ourselves in that thinking and do a lot of research and understand where Savage writing this extraordinary book had got his influences from and what it had felt like because the book felt like it was something that really had lived experience in it. So very early on we went to Montana um, and we met his family and we went to the ranch uh, where he'd grown up and where he'd experienced lots of the things that we think had influenced the drama of the book and the, the book has a lot of um, mystery in it and psychological tension so we wanted to be able to capture that in the landscape and uh, and in the way in which we approach building and structuring the story. Um, and we went to visit Annie Prue uh, because Annie Prue had written the afterword for the, uh, for the novel when it had been republished. And we kind of got her blessing on how to interpret this story. And we felt having done that, that it was okay that people so different from the writer himself would be able to uh, embody and take that story on. Uh, and, you know, Jane Campion uh, has such a, a storied career, of course, uh, but she's not the first director you'd necessarily think of for uh, the Western genre, and this feels like a very different take on it. Uh, what, what do you feel that, like, in, you know, over the course of making this film that she brought to it that was uh, especially fresh and unique to, to her own vision? Well, I think in a way it's set in the West, but really it's more of a psychological drama. I mean, it's a Western without guns. Uh, it's really complex in its layering of the four central um, protagonists who uh, are played brilliantly, I think, in the film by Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Jesse Plemons, 
Kirsten Dunst and Cody, Cody Smith McPhee. And it's um, that that there, there are a series of um, movements within the film that really dig into desire, love, isolation, repression, gender expression, what society forces you to be, the danger of prejudice, what happens when you're isolated and alone and vulnerable. Um, and all of these are themes that she's a master of handling. So for me, it was quite exciting actually to have Jane make a film with a male protagonist at the center, but where she was able to dig in and unearth kind of the kind of vulnerabilities and sensitivities that you wouldn't necessarily imagine would take place on a, a ranch in the American West and to do it with the kind of sensual and visual filmmaking that is her signature. Um, and you know, you mentioned uh, uh, this this really excellent cast. Uh, but you know, over the course of any number of productions, you know, there there you know people's schedules change, and so there were some cast changes behind the scenes of this. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Moss and Paul Dano had been attached. Uh, you know, what what what's what's it like, kind of balancing all of that out, and 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 you know, kind of keeping things on track as people's schedules are changing and changes are, are needed. Yeah, I mean, I think all the producers on this round table will tell you that's one of the, the, the real challenges is trying to get everything to magically come together on the dates you need it, it to work out with. And it, we did lose um, Lizzie and Paul on, on the way, but actually we were very lucky because um, we got Jesse and Kirsten, who in, um, in actual fact, Jesse had initially been our first choice for the part, but his schedule hadn't enabled us to make that happen. And at the time, uh, Kirsten had said, I can't believe, Jesse, you're going to be the one who's um, who's going to be in the Jane Campion film because Jesse and Kirsten also live together in real life. Um, but then, obviously, when the opportunity arose, Kirsten was the absolute first choice for us. And it was great to be able to work with the two of them together and for them to bring that extra um, quality of um, shared experience to the film and to ground it in this real... American heartland, which they were able to bring. I mean, the other challenge we had as producers uh, casting this film is, of course, we structured it as a New Zealand uh, Australian co production, which meant that both in terms of casting and crew, we really had to try and do the best we could to work with people from those territories. So we had some exemptions for the leads because obviously. Um, that was going to be critical in terms of getting the right people to play those parts. But, uh, but that was also an additional challenge that we faced when we were looking at who we would and wouldn't be able to use. Um, and, you know, the biggest logistical challenge of all, COVID, uh, you know, this, this film had a, a break in the middle because of lockdowns. Uh, what was it like sort of, you know, what were you thinking when, you know, production had to pause and, you know, were you thinking, is this ever going to, come together or, you know, what, what's kind of going through your head during that process? Yeah, I mean, COVID hit, hit us for six. You know, we were in New Zealand, which was the country that seemed to have done the best job of uh, protecting itself from, in, you know, infection. Um, and we'd managed to shoot all of our exteriors down in the South Island, which is where we had, you know, located the, the ranch. And actually the, the whole putting together of that production was, probably harder than what happened when COVID struck us because we had to build an entire world that was, we had to build our own period Montana in New Zealand. Grant Major, who did a phenomenal job, has never ever been to America. Um, we were in very, very tricky conditions and we um, had three months to, to build everything from scratch in weather conditions that felt like they were never ever going to relent and enable us to do that. So. The minute we finished our location shooting, we thought, well, nothing, um, nothing can go wrong now. We've managed to, we've managed to just get that in the can. We'll just do our interiors and we'll be away. And um, and then all of a sudden, the um, infection rate in New Zealand um, escalated, and the country shut down. We had forty eight hours to get everyone home and safe, and we had no idea how long it would take. Um, because we didn't know whether it would be possible for a vaccine to be invented. So it was, um, it was a real challenge, but we had a, a steadfast crew, an extraordinary um, line producer in New Zealand, Chloe Smith, who was absolutely amazing at keeping the possibility of the film going together, as were my producing partner, Seesaw. And, um, and when we got back together and everyone came in, 
um, there was a real family spirit. It's what Tamar was talking about. Everybody really wanted to finish the film and, um, and it gave it an extra energy and an extra sense of purpose, I think. Uh, now, over the course of your career, you've uh, worked on everything from independent films all the way up to Harry Potter. Uh, mm -hmm. How different is it kind of, you know, is it a completely different animal realizing uh, a smaller film as opposed to uh, like a blockbuster with uh, so many more moving parts? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very different. But for me, the reason I do this is because I love filmmakers. And so in a sense, I love the stories and I love filmmakers. So my objective is to try and enable them to achieve their vision. So the difference is really to do with whether what, what toys they need, what requirements they need, what the story needs, who the financiers are. But actually, the bit I do is about trying to work out how you can best marry material with the artist and then work out how to provide an infrastructure that makes sense. Um, there's never enough money. It's amazing that even on the big film, films, you never feel you have enough money. But uh, I think the nicest thing is being able to pull together teams of um, cast and crew and, and individuals who just want to, um, to work with the filmmakers you're working with. And so like on this film, we got to work with Johnny Greenwood who did our score and did an amazing score, making this kind of period story feel very modern, uh, but also classical at the same time. But Johnny was also in, very briefly, in the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire where he played one of the Weird Sisters. So sometimes you can get, um, you can get the strangest collaborations to reappear <laughs> across different films. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, congratulations on all your uh, collaborative work with the cast and crew of this film. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it and best of luck in, in the weeks and months to come as people see it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Julie O, oh, you produced Tick, Tick, Boom, uh, based on the autobiographical music, uh, musical by Broadway composer Jonathan Larson, uh, whose most famous musical, of course, was Rent. Uh, did you have a lot of familiarity with with Larson and his work uh, going into making this film? You know, I, I grew up absolutely obsessed with Rent, like so many of my peers and so many people around the world. The impact of that musical, I think, is truly extraordinary in just how it basically started a cultural revolution. But my introduction to Tick, Tick, Boom actually didn't happen until 2014. Um, when I was lucky enough to get a ticket to one of the handful of performances at Encores on 55th Street here in New York. And lin Miranda was playing the main role of John. And I think there are very few moments in your life when you see something and it feels like it was written for you and you sit there in the audience and the first thing that you want to do is share it with someone. And after I saw it, I immediately asked myself, why doesn't the world know about this? Uh, this extraordinary story of struggling, not, not knowing where you're going to go, being at a crossroads in life and having to choose a path either which way. Um, and I immediately set out to figure out where are the movie rights to this? And that led me to Julie Larson, uh, who I think is everything in regards to this film. She is Jonathan Larson's sister who really took up the torch after he passed away 25 years ago and has been championing his legacy ever since. And, and what was it like uh, working with her to kind of uh, create this, you know, not only this musical that he wrote, but very much uh, about him himself and his own life and his own career and ambitions? Um, Julie Larson from our first meeting um, gave us so much trust and love and what we understood was that we had an enormous responsibility to get this right and to do justice to her brother's work. And so the very first person that we went to when thinking about how are you putting a movie together in a way that the captain of the ship is the right person for this mission, um, the only person that was ever going to direct this movie was Lin Miranda. And I got Julie's blessing in order to approach him, the busiest man in the world, um, and he has still never written back so quickly to an email. And, you know, Jonathan is someone who is so important to Lynn. You know, he was, he, he saw Rent when he was 17 years old in a really terrible seat in the back of a the theater. He saw Tick, Tick, Boom as a college senior right before he was about to dive into his 20s. And he truly felt like it was a message in a bottle 
Um, and to, on top of that, he is a genius storyteller in whatever medium. And from our very first meeting, there is, a, there is a immediate alignment of, we want to do this and we want to do this the right way. So let's go and figure that out. And what was it like working with him as him being a, a first time director? Uh, like, what was that process like of, of putting this film together with him? Um, he was a first time filmmaker, but I do believe that he had been waiting his entire life to direct this movie. Uh, I think if movies cost a little bit less than theater, there is a world in which he didn't take a little detour through Broadway, but immediately went into filmmaking. He is such a cinephile. He's such a passion uh, for telling stories on the screen. And once we started talking, he spent the next couple of years basically going to his version of getting his PhD. Um, you know, he shadowed John Chu on In the Heights. He worked with Rob Marshall on Mary Poppins Returns. And he approached this as though he was getting an education um, because he really wanted to do justice to this story. Uh, and, you know, him being, of course, this uh, incredibly uh, well-known theater composer, uh, you know, this film also feels like a love letter to Broadway because you have so many supporting, like the count number of Tonys and Tony nominations and Broadway stars in the supporting and cameo roles is kind of, is kind of like a delight finding all those Easter eggs as a viewer. Um, you know, was it easy to get so many people to work on this with Lin-Manuel Miranda and his uh, credibility in Broadway uh, sort of uh, backing it up? Uh, the more you look at all of the actors that came to the table for this movie, the more you realize just how nerdy we are when it comes to musical theater. Um, I think for all of us, this was a dream come true. Um, but what's most meaningful is that, you know, we were a production that started shooting in March uh, like so many other films, we were shut down, went on a hiatus, and when we came back and finished it in New York City in fall 2020, we were, we were making a love letter to theater at a time when you couldn't go see a musical for the first time, and I, I don't know if that has ever happened. And the community rallied around us in such a way and showed up for every single part, went through all of the enormous amounts of COVID protocols, and the wonderful thing about Lynn is that he sees opportunity in every single situation. And so that was the perfect attitude for us as we tried to figure out how do we move forward in this entirely new landscape. And there are so many silver linings that came up where um, a, a big set piece for us is New York Theater Workshop. And New York Theater Workshop is never available to film in because it should never be available to film in because it should always be showcasing new works. And we were literally going to recreate it in a factory in Bushwick. And when we went back in the fall, my, my friend's production had been interrupted by the pandemic and New York Theater Workshop was dark. And we reached out to them and asked if we could actually film there. And we got to spend a little more than a week actually in the space where Jonathan Larson performed, debuted Rent with the brick walls that just held so much history. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that this is how it happened because you can't recreate that. Uh, and then of course you've got uh, 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 Andrew Garfield in the lead role. He's not only a, a well-known film actor, but also a Tony winning uh, Broadway actor. Um, what made him right for this role and, and, and for this part uh, to, to kind of fill Jonathan Larson's shoes? Um, in, in the same way that no one else was ever going to direct this movie, we feel that way about Andrew. Um, we, we approach the development of this project as though we were making a musical. Um, and so we started with the research process. And when we finally had our first script, um, we did the only thing we knew how to do, which is we said, let's put on a workshop and let's get in a room and let's hear it out loud and let's hear the music and let's see what we have in front of us. And Lynn called me and he said, I have my John, it's Andrew Garfield. And I said, I love Andrew Garfield, can he sing? And neither of us knew the answer to that question. Um, but what we did know is I had seen Andrew uh, on stage more than five times on Death of a Salesman opposite Philip Seymour Hoffman and Linda Eamond. 
Lynn had seen him in Angels in America. And these are such physical feats to be on stage for hours, giving it your all. And we really felt like Andrew could do anything he set his mind to. And from the first moment that he showed up at that workshop, which we held kind of secretly uptown in Washington Heights, um, he latched on into the world of John and he got it. And I remember after our first week, Julie Larson turned to me and she said, I feel like he's channeling my brother. And that was an ex extraordinary vote of confidence that just made us feel like, okay, we're on the right track. Uh, and one thing that's sort of remarkable about this uh, film and this story, it's set in 1990, uh, but it still resonates so much right now uh, with, you know, a person turning 30 and, and, and being uncertain about where their life is going to take them and also living through uh, seeing a lot of their friends and family get, get sick and, and pass away uh, that then during the AIDS crisis. And now we've got COVID um, like, what did you think about how this was kind of echoing into the present, even though it's sort of a period film? Um, Tick, Tick, Boom is set in 1990. And I think the thing that you forget is that as, as HIV AIDS was ravaging a community, there were no answers. And as we were making the movie, I, I distinctly remember it was March 12th, 2020. And we were shooting outside of Jonathan Larson's real apartment on Greenwich Street. And it was a scary day where you were hearing Broadway's about to shut down. Maybe they're gonna cut, uh, you know, cut off all ability to leave the island of Manhattan. And we just kept thinking, this is something that none of us had ever experienced before. And as a producer, your job is to protect everyone on your crew and your cast, everyone who is there to do their best work. And during our hiatus, there was so much uncertainty. Can we keep shooting? What is the best way to do this? How do you make a musical where people sing while also being safe in a world where there isn't a vaccine yet? Um, and I feel like the themes that are within the movie started to just creep closer and closer to all of us personally. Um, and we did the only thing that felt right, which is we would gather on these Zooms that we would call Tick Tick Zooms every week or so, and we would play trivia and we would check in with each other and um, we would just look for the humanity in the moment. Uh, well, uh, congratulations on your work on this film under uh, you know difficult circumstances as everyone we've been talking to uh, has been making films under this current climate. Uh, so uh, congratulations again. Thank you so much for talking with, uh, talking with me about it. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome to our Meet the Experts film producers panel. Uh, I'm joined by Todd Black from Being the Ricardos, Tamar Thomas from Belfast, Tanya Sagachian from The Power of the Dog, and Julie O oh from Tick, Tick, Boom. Uh, so first off, a big question. Uh, what, what inspired you to get into the industry and, and how did you get started? Because you all seem so incredibly thoughtful and passionate uh, uh, about what you do. Uh, let's start with Julie. Um. For me, I think it was a sign when I was 12 years old and I had trouble with math problems, but I could remember all the cast and crew for whatever movie that I saw, uh, that a light really went out in my head that just thought, this is something that I genuinely love. Um, but I, I think there's a part of me that really loves to shepherd something from beginning to end. And I think that at its core is what a producer does. And um, I spent, over a decade going and learning from producers whose work I really admired and respected. And I feel like what I was able to do on Tick, Tick, Boom was to take the things that I thought were great that you could do and, and to sort of do my own version of it, uh, but assume the responsibility that I think is very crucial on a set um, because I think that producing, there is nothing that is not your job, uh, which I think everyone here would probably agree with. Uh, how about you, Tanya? Um, well, uh, ironically, I think what inspired me to get into the film business was probably Jane Campion. So the idea that um, I've ended up making a feature film with Jane Campion and producing it and becoming her creative collaborator and friend is, uh, is an unbelievable dream come true. Um, I, I, I was always a fantasist. I always wanted to make things up. I 
dabbled in theatre and television and documentaries. Um, but for me, film was the um, absolute space that I wanted to be in, but it didn't look like it was a space that was really going to be that welcoming for women. And, um, and I think that one of the things Jane did was absolutely prove that if you stuck to your taste and your vision, your conviction and your artistry, it would be possible. So, um, you know, I have to pay, pay service to that debt. Don? Um, mine sounds very cliche, but it's true. Uh, when I was a kid uh, growing up uh, uh, until I was seven in Oklahoma City where my dad was going to law school, uh, I pretended I was sick one day uh, so I could stay at home. And my mom, uh, my mom was very funny. She said, let's go see a movie because I know you're not sick. So she took me to a Disney movie. I think it was Bambi. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it was Bambi. Um, and um, and I remember uh, vividly the red velvet seats in the theater. And we were like the only people because it was in the middle of the afternoon on a weekday. And the, I kept looking at the projection booth and I, I kept wondering how that ray of light with all the dust in it kept making what I was seeing on the screen. I, I was obsessed with it. Um, it was almost like cinema paradiso for me. And um, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't, my brain was short circuiting and I literally remember going, I gotta, I gotta do that, whatever that meant to a seven-year-old. And um, that stuck with me. And plus I loved theater. I loved storytelling. Um, I loved playwrights. I went to USC's drama school because I didn't know about cinema school, uh, which I'm really happy I did. And I loved playwrights. I loved the whole idea of these incredible um, plays, but you had to use your imagination. They weren't cinematic necessarily. So that, that for me was a real benefit. And I just knew I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to make people either laugh or cry or whatever it was. Um, and I just figured it out how to get the ray of light on the screen ultimately. So that, that's kind of how it happened for me. Hey, Mark? Mine was a bit like Todd to sort of remember watching the TV and wanting to look behind it as a child going, where are those people? Mm -hmm. And thinking, oh, what, what is that? And then I got an opportunity. I was a, a sort of a, a punk and had a very strange hairstyle and got the chance to be an extra on a TV show mm -hmm. and went and just thought, this is a magical place. I just love the creativity and the sort of the thing that everybody working together to achieve this one thing at this one time. And I just loved it. And just, and then since then, I've tried to sort of, with theatre and film and radio, that thing about bringing people together to do their best work at that time together. It's just fascinating. And I love that putting matchmaking folk together and making little families. It was great. Uh, and, and yeah, I've talked with all of you individually about a lot of the challenges that go into making any film, um, you know, and any film can be a years long process to uh, get it off the ground uh, and get all of the ducks in a row and get all the pieces together. Uh, so what is it that really makes you uh, about a project that really makes you want to commit to spending that time and really making it happen? Like what, what, what is, how does it have to speak to you, uh, Tamar? So when you read that script and it just really hit, it makes you cry, it makes you laugh or whatever, and it just hits your heart and you just think, I'm going to do everything in my power to make that the filmmaker's vision come on the screen or on the stage or wherever. That You just know in your heart that that's what you want to do and you'll fight to make that happen. Todd? Always the script. Um... I remember years ago, I asked to meet with Denzel Washington in 1989. I was a young baby producer. And I think Glory had just come out. I was blown away by his performance. I thought it was like, I, I couldn't speak. And, and so I, I met with him for lunch. He was very lovely to meet with me. And he said, he looked at me at one point, he goes, why are we meeting? Why am I meeting you? I don't know you, you're a kid, whatever. And I said, because I want to work with you. And he goes, well, I'm just going to tell you one thing. He said, when you read a script, 
and it keeps you up at night and your heart is pounding after you put it down and you can't sleep because you cannot stop thinking about it. If it has a role in it for me, call me, but don't call me before then. And the same as Tamar said, it's a script. If you read a script um, or you hear a story um, or somebody's true life story and you can't get it out of your head, and it's in your heart and it's making your heart pound, um, then you have to go make it. You have to do everything in your power to go make it because I can promise you if it's affecting, if it's affecting me that way or Tamar or, or Tanya or Julie, I can promise you it's affecting a lot of other people. So it's our jobs as producers to have to go get that story made. So that's what it is for me, the script. Tanya? I think it's three things for me, actually, and maybe I'm a little more selfish than the others. Um, it's the filmmaker. Uh, I, I'm really filmmaker driven and I, and I like to work with people who I think can see things that I can't see and will enable me to see differently as a result. Um, it's the story. I have to be moved by it. Like, like Todd and Tamar, I, I need to know that it makes me laugh or it makes me cry or that I... I'm gonna be able to live with it for several years because we know these things take several years and I, I've gotta be able to wake up every morning being excited about what it is. And I think if I am, then I can communicate it. But also I think it's knowing that the people you put together and that you're working with will be a family or that you can form a kind of friendship or intimacy with them because this job is too hard if you're with unpleasant people. So it's, it's a combination of all of those things for me. And that may seem a bit more selfish, but somehow I think that if they're all together, you can communicate or create a better thing that other people can do. Billy? I mean, I think everyone has, has spoken so beautifully about it and it just really comes down to how does it make you feel? And uh, when I saw Tick, Tick, Boom, I cried through the entire thing, even in the parts that were happy that you shouldn't be crying during. And it's that feeling that if this is really touching you so deeply here, chances are it's going to do that for someone else. And it might be exactly the thing they need in their life at that time. And I think that imbues the mission with just another level of importance that, that gives you that drive to wake up every single morning. Uh, because as a producer, you're always pitching and people are always telling you, I don't know about that. And so you really have to be so passionate that you're gonna get it over the top. Uh, now, with, uh, you know, filmmaking, uh, just as a business, everyone has to start somewhere and it can be very difficult, obviously, to to break through. So I'm wondering uh, what, you know, you guys at different, uh, you know, uh, points in your career uh, where you are now, uh, if you have advice to people coming up uh, or, or advice that you wish you'd gotten, things you wish you knew uh, uh, about the business and about producing uh, when you started. Uh, how about I start with you, Tanya? Yeah, I mean, I was given a piece of advice by um, a legendary British television producer and filmmaker, uh, Tony Garnett, who uh, created a lot of work mm. with Ken Loach that changed Britain in the 60s and then went on to do fantastic stuff in film television. And Tony said to me, trust your taste. The only thing that matters is your taste. Have it, stick to it, and one day you'll be called upon to actually stand by it and deliver it. And I, I thought that there's got to be more to it than that. But in actual fact, if I look back at my career, it, even when things look, look so obvious with hindsight, like Harry Potter, it, it wasn't obvious to anyone else in 1997, apart from a lot of 11 year olds. But I read that book and I knew it made me cry, even though I was too old to be reading a children's book that was going to make me cry. And look what happened. And if Tony hadn't said to me, trust your taste, I don't know that I'd have had the confidence to have actually said this kid's book is going to be for everybody. Uh, Todd? Well, I echo Tanya 150%. But also um, I would say, and it's the same thing that you're saying, Tanya, not only trust your taste, find a piece of material. If you're, I just, I just was uh, asked to, to speak to a, a USC film school class two nights ago. And I, and I, the same question came up actually. And, um, and I said, not only trust your taste because that's really all you have. No one can really take that away from you. 
Uh, they can take everything else away as a producer, but they can't take your taste away. Um, but I said, you know, find a piece of material. You know, may it be from a local newspaper in a little tiny town that you grew up in or a big newspaper in a, in a town you, city you, you grew up in. May it be uh, going to a, a bookstore that sells, you know, wonderful used books and you can talk to the uh, bookstore purveyor and say, what's your, what are your favorite books that nobody's ever heard of? You know, whatever it is, find a piece of material. I, I find oftentimes young producers struggle with, I don't know how to get in the business and it's so hard now and all those things, which are all true. It was hard then, by the way, I'm sure, I'm sure you three ladies would agree with me. It's never not been hard. When I, whenever I hear people say, oh my God, the business is so hard right now. I'm like, when hasn't it been hard? But I think as a young person, you know, taste a hundred percent and find something you like. Find a true life story, find a book, find a play, find an article, find something somewhere. I mean, you know, so many of the young people today, they have, and I sound really old and I am, um, but you have the internet. We didn't have the, I didn't have the internet growing up. Truly you did. And Tim, <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, um, you know, find a piece of material, find a story you like and, and let it, hopefully it matches your taste. Julie? Um, I got a very similar piece of advice as Tanya, and it was uh, your taste and your relationships are everything. And when I got it, I was too young to understand what that meant. I was like, sure, that's a thing. Uh, but what I've realized is that that is everything. Having conviction on why you love something or why it's not for you, having a point of view that you're coming to the table with. And then on top of that, your relationships, which are the people that are in your life, that is everything. And what I've found is that almost every single person I have met at some point in my career always comes back in some way that is meaningful and important. And so that advice that I got when I was very young uh, has actually ended up being the truest thing. Even if you don't want them to come back sometimes, but that's a different always story. Always do. <laughs> <laughs> Tamar? I agree with Julie. It's, it, for me, it's, a, you know, for helping people come into the business, it's about asking questions and making relationships. You know, you need to talk to everybody that you can and, you know, ask for help. Say, I have advice. Admit that you don't know and say, what can I do? And you'll find that most of the community are kind and will give you time and will help you if they can. And um, you, you'll be amazed about how many people you meet and then how those opportunities then open up for you. Well, I, I want to uh, congratulate all of you once more on all of the great work you've done this year and have done throughout your uh, careers uh, and will do in the years to come, I'm sure. Um, and it, it's been a pleasure talking to, to all of you about it. Thank you so much. No way. Look forward to seeing all your films. Thank you yes, very, very much. Super Thank excited. You. Congrats, everybody. Yeah. Congratulations.